lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I'm Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. Woohoo! We're back. We're back. We're back. We only took a week off. (laughs) I I, mean, I wanted to meet up last week so we could talk about some of this stuff, but I just, I couldn't find a comfortable position to sit for (laughs) an hour hour. and and do this, so. It's all um, good. We could have. Uh, you know, I, I, so I have been tempted to try and do this from another room. Like we've, we're all yeah. closed off in this office yeah. um, and that seems to work, but like, with all the, the well, with as much as I figured out about the audio editing software yeah. and how much I can remove, how much, you know, artifact noise I can remove um, from these recordings, uh, we probably could do this from, you know, like my dining room table or something. Yeah. Or the couch. Just hold the mic in your hand. Well, yeah, maybe. <laughs> I mean, that know, might be better. Maybe we try that in the future. No, I don't trust you just holding the mic. Man. Come on, man, I can hold the mic. <laughs> I'm not gonna. <laughs> the, I'm not gonna drop the mic. Maybe we. Yeah, maybe we need to get the you know the big stands that you can put on the floor, uh, the floor stand. The floor stand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you know, with a swivel and everything, so you can move it around. But I don't. I don't have to trust you to actually the like grip hand, the yeah keep for it an hour. The time. <laughs> Get mad and throw it on the ground. <laughs> there will be none of that. You will owe me a microphone. <laughs> right. An expensive <laughs> microphone. <laughs> yes. Or you can get a crappy one, but you have to use a crappy one. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's the punishment. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, what's happened in two, two weeks? weeks? Yeah. What's yeah. happened in two weeks? So um, I guess, what did you end up, so I'm not I'm not drinking tonight because I've been doing the, the um, shots for yeah. the allergies. And you I mean always, the allergy shots, not like shots, shots, not like going out to party right, shots. Right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah. So I have the the not fun shot, and then I can't have the fun shot. Hey, there you go. I mean, I could, I think I probably could, but I always feel weird it makes afterwards. Even, so yeah. I, I don't want to. Yeah. Um, would you end up choosing? It's to, the Japanese one. Is it the okay. Hideki? It's not the Hideki. N- no, no, no. Um, it was uh, Sensei or S. something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's the one you got me. It is. It's good. Yeah. Uh, that's what I'm sipping on. I like it. Yeah. Um, they tend to be very uh, balanced, the yeah. Japanese whiskeys. Yeah. Like, you would think that Japanese whiskey would suck, but well, it I doesn't at all. When the, the first <laughs> time I tried it was with you, you had bought, I think it was the Hideki. Um, it's uh, Hibiki. Hibiki, yeah. yeah. And um, I was surprised. I was shocked. I did not expect it to be good at all. Like I was, too. I picked it up because it was on clearance. Yeah. Um, and uh, at the uh, fancy ABC store. And uh, I was like, oh, I'll give this a shot. And it had nice packaging and everything. Cause you know, they go all out Oh yeah, <laughs> in Japan. Like everything's nice about it. I kept the bottle too. Yeah. Like I, I soaked it so that I could get the label off and everything. It's like this really nice glass bottle. It's, it's a beautiful bottle too. But anyway, yeah. So I, I got it home and I was like, all right, well, you know, I'll try this eventually. And I eventually did. And I was like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow, this is really good whiskey. Yeah. Did not expect that. <laughs> yeah. Those Japanese. They, they, they know what they're doing. Yeah. Um, and it's so if you don't like scotch because you don't like the smoky flavor, first off, there's plenty of scotches that don't have the smoky flavor. Wow. But um and so you should just seek out one of those. But if you if you don't like scotch because you don't like the smoky flavor, try a Japanese whiskey. Because yeah. it's in the scotch pattern, but they don't have the the peat smoke. Yeah. Um, flavor and and they're like I said they're really well balanced they're they're very tasty oh, tasty yeah. whiskey very good I like it probably not all of them but it you know yeah enough. this this one isn't <laughs> as good as the first one I had tried with you but it's still mm-hmm. good like yeah. I mean I, I poured a glass because I like it you know yeah so. um the one I got in Houston I can't remember what it was called now was also pretty good but it wasn't as good as the Hibiki either yeah. the the Hibiki the best one I've had yeah. yeah um well we may as well you know we're, we're losing. Daylight here, I guess. Um, we may <laughs> yeah. as well jump right into it. So it's we we did a little like just um, just a little talk about the DNC at the end of the last episode, and uh, we wanted to go into more detail um, now that I've listened to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now that Mike's listened to it. <laughs> um, so it was uh, man, it was it was interesting, and I understand why people said it was kind of dark. Yeah, it is like a very dark vision of of what's going on, and um, and I I have to say that I don't I, I feel like they're falling into the same trap they fell into in 2016, um, which is the you know essentially Hillary's thing was I'm not 
Trump. Yeah. And I feel like Biden's doing the same thing. Like yeah. his his selling point isn't that he's Biden, it's that he's <laughs> not Trump. Yeah. And that's that's exactly it. And and on the other thing he <clears throat> claims that well he he has a a, a black um vice president or whatever like that's, oh, yeah. that's like the and hillary's thing was well i'm a woman and i'm not trump yeah. and that's kind of biden's thing is <laughs> well i was obama's vice president and now i have a black vice president <laughs> so and i'm not trump like, and it's a woman <laughs> and it's a woman yeah. like like that's the it's the whole virtue signal thing is mm-hmm. kind of what his campaign is all like hinging on yeah and like, how terrible trump is well yeah yeah that's that's also a, bi- a big part of it yeah but um now, I, I don't think that it'll fail quite as spectacularly for Biden as it did for Hillary, because um, Hillary was intensely unlikable. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Biden, I, you don't dislike him in the same way. Like, no. Um, it, you do. I don't know that he's particularly, like, you kind of feel, feel I, sorry it, for well, him. Well, I was going to say, at this point... <laughs> You just feel sorry for him, or at yeah. least that's that's my take on it. Yeah, that's um, how I feel too. Because you 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 know he's a man that's kind of at the end of his run. Mm-hmm. Like he just you have everything about him has that feel. Yeah, you know, I mean, whether you believe he's like has Alzheimer's or whatever, you mm-hmm. know, dementia, mm-hmm. um, he's he's still definitely kind of at the end of his run. Yeah. Um, and it's not the same energy with Trump. Like Trump's still got the energy mm-hmm. and the passion. You know, I know we're not really talking about the RNC, but Trump's speech at the RNC, I mean, I thought he did pretty good. And it was a, a stark contrast between Biden mm-hmm. as far as like energy level and, and things like that. Yeah. So. Well, at this point, I still would put my money on Trump yeah. um, to, to win. Again, I would I would uh, agree with that. I mean, I think it's going to be close, and I I think that it could go either way. But mm-hmm. but I I feel like Trump kind of has an edge just yeah. because he is the. I mean, he just has the energy, you know, yeah. and, and that stuff's important. Like mm-hmm. that's important. Like people subconsciously they make a lot of decisions off that type of thing. You know, yeah. he's the alpha. You know. Yeah, I mean, to me, a lot of it is just like the kind of enthusiasm that you can generate. And a lot of people hate Trump. Oh, yeah. And not nearly as many people hate Biden as hated Hillary. Yeah. Um, but a lot of people love Trump. Yeah. Well, that's and that's the and thing. And I don't feel like that the people, that kind of passion exists for Biden. No, there's none of that for Biden at all. Um, I mean, the the energy that Biden has is the anti-Trump energy. Mm-hmm. Like that's the only energy that exists there. Yeah. Um, and the Trump people, the people that like Trump, like Trump a lot. Like, yeah. and they're willing to get get out and go do stuff for him. Yeah. Um, and that's something just kind of as an aside with the Libertarian Party that we need. Like, because mm-hmm. that's part of the reason I didn't go do a bunch of stuff for Jorgensen is because I just don't have that energy for her. Like, mm-hmm. I don't have that passion. Um, and that's that's important, like, because that, that passion comes in when you have people that go out and do stuff on your behalf, like collect signatures or go knock on doors yeah. and do that on the ground work. And Trump has plenty of people that are willing to do that on the ground work, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, I, I feel like I could have... Uh been um more excited for the libertarian candidate if it had been um jacob hornberger or john mons i agree like uh both of those people i feel like i would have had had more energy to go out and and um contend with people's reaction to somebody knocking on their door in the middle of a pandemic (laughs) Um, i mean because that's a big part of it like if we weren't dealing with the pandemic i'd be more willing to go out there and knock on doors for jorgensen but I, i probably would too maybe I mean, I say that, but at the same time, when we were talking about going and doing that for the you know, the election or whatever to go mm-hmm. go do the poll stands or whatever, yeah, um, like it's just I didn't have. I was like, I'm going to take my time out of my mm-hmm. day to go do this, yeah, for this person, and I'm lukewarm about mm-hmm. at best. Yeah, <laughs> well, and and that's kind of the point with the Trump Biden thing is that like just rain in the right places. Yeah. You know, um, there are plenty of Trump voters that are willing to stand out in line in the rain to vote for Trump. And I don't feel like there are that many that are willing to stand in line in the rain to vote for Biden or even to vote against Trump. Yeah, because and that's really what it would be is against Trump. And I'm with you. I don't think that that passion is there. Yeah. Um, And it could, like I say, it could still go either way. But 
I just I, I give the edge to Trump for sure especially after the RNC, mm -hmm. because we'll talk about the RNC in depth next week. But the Republicans did a pretty good job with theirs. I felt mm -hmm. like after watching the two, like the RNC squashed the DNC as yeah. far as... Well, just in terms of production value. Yeah, well, and but that has a lot to do with it. Yeah. And that, that actually is important. Like that's like, it felt like I was watching like a reality TV show mm -hmm. and was being entertained. Yeah. And the RNC was... God, it was boring, man. Like, you mean the DNC? The DNC, yeah, yeah. The DNC was boring, man, yeah. and and felt awkward. Like it had that awkward, like COVID feel. Like I'll call it the COVID feel because like the <laughs> the night night shows have it too, where mm -hmm. they like they're in this room and they're trying to do stand up, and it doesn't work. Like yeah. without the the audience and the laugh track and the whole thing, like it doesn't. It mm -hmm. just comes off awkward yeah it's not a laugh track anymore it's a sign that comes on tells the audience that they need to clap at any rate without <laughs> it there it's just you can't do and and that's how the dnc felt like it just mm -hmm. felt had that awkward feel to it and the rnc didn't have that yeah well um i th i don't know if i want to go into specifics and then do well i guess we probably cover the speeches and then we come back to just like general feel about yeah what was going on um, so I thought that it was kind of, uh, important to point out, um, particularly as somebody who is, uh, who foreign policy is one of the most important issues, um, is that, uh, John Kasich and Colin Powell, um, <laughs> spoke at the DNC. Yeah. And to me, it they was were day just, oneers. They were yeah. on the first day. Yeah. Um, to me, it was just a sign that. Um, the, the neocons have moved back to the Democrat party. Yeah. That, you know, the, oh, without question. I mean, that's, that's, you were, they, what they wanted you to take from that was that Trump is so bad that we've got Republicans coming over to our side, mm -hmm. but anybody that really pays attention to this type of stuff sees right past that. And is like, this is where the Hawks live now. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and if you know anything about the backgrounds of uh, both Biden and um, Harris, uh, you know that they are war state military industrial complex representatives. They yeah. they are absolutely. I mean, so Biden, um, he uh, was the chair or whatever the committee um, that put together the debates on the on whether to go into Iraq or not. Oh, okay. Um, and he stacked them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, he didn't bring in, he didn't bring in naysayers. He brought in people that would support the plan to go into Iraq. Yeah. Um, and now was he, this the first or second time? First time. First time. Okay. And, uh, he, wait, good question. <laughs> 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 um, no. Second time, you know, the, the, the first second, time, the second time was so long ago. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, but he was there for all of it. So. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and he is, he's a war state guy. He's yeah. somebody who really believes that the um, Americans need to project their power all over the world, yeah. um, to make the world safer, whatever. I'm not yeah. sure. Fight them over there. So we don't have to fight them over here. Yeah, he's, he's one of those. Yeah. Um, in fact, the Colin Powell, uh, pulled a quote from Biden. That was something like, um, uh, we need to, uh, have power in our display and display our power or something like that. I, I yeah. don't remember exactly <laughs> what the quote was, but it was something along know, those lines. Yeah. yeah. Um, which is insane. So, uh, and then <laughs> I was talking to you about this before we got started. I did see a clip from Colin Powell talking about the importance of this election. And I can't remember where it was from or where I saw it. Um, but I, I don't, you know, do a lot of, uh, just like, um, random YouTube things or whatever. I mean, I'm yeah. generally looking at legitimate news sources. Yeah. I mean, you're not yeah. looking at a lot of satire. Yeah. Um, but at where he invoked the, Iraq WMD threat in terms of, you know, that the, that president Trump was as dangerous as the Iraqi WMDs. And yeah. I was like, what? <laughs> wow. Like we're going to pull that line out. Yeah. So maybe <laughs> Let's was remind real and, everybody of that. <laughs> yeah. So maybe it was real and maybe it wasn't. But, um, for those of you who are unaware, uh, Colin Powell is the guy that sat down in front of the UN and just bold face lied to everybody there about the, it, 
Iraqi <laughs> WMD threat to justify um, American Going intervention. In. Yeah. Um, and and he knew better. Yeah. Like he absolutely knew better. This is the guy who was the Secretary of State or, yeah, or whatever when, at the time. That's when he went in and made the pitch to try to get other countries to come along with us. Exactly. And basically, nobody came along with us, and we went it alone. <laughs> yeah, because they probably had as good of intelligence as we did and knew better also. Yeah. But you know, didn't stop everybody from going out in line. And yeah. they lied to the American people for a long period of time too. And hopefully yeah. if you pay any attention to politics, and I assume that you do, if you're listening to this podcast, um, you have been made aware since then that yeah. that was all a bunch of lies yeah. that we knew better years before that they were no longer had a WMD program and had dismantled what they had. Yeah. But <laughs> you know, the idea that he would, and so the other thing I thought was, uh, like maybe that's code. Maybe he's saying this isn't really a threat, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Since the Iraqi WMD thing was made up, maybe the threat of Trump is also made up. This is all, yeah. yeah. It, which, by the way, it clearly is. He's been the president for three and a half years now, something like that. Yeah. Although More the world, the world feels like it's ending. It's not really his fault. <laughs> you know, it was funny. I So I was listening to some science podcasting today, yeah. and uh, one of the podcasts I listened to was about how the universe will end. Oh, yeah. Um, and, uh, and surprisingly, perhaps there was no mention of Trump at all. Wow. That's amazing. It, it, is, it is incredibly <laughs> unlikely that Trump is how the universe ends. Yeah. Oh. Until somebody made a bad joke at the end, and they even admitted it was a cheap joke when they said something like, oh, that'll be the final Trump. <laughs> or something like that. Anyway. Hey, I like bad jokes. That's good. <laughs> um, so uh, moving on from the, that your, your Hawks have moved to the left. Yep. Um, where they started by yep. the way, but, uh, the Hawks have moved uh, back to the Democrat party. Um, then I watched Cuomo's speech. I don't know that I watched these in order. I, I watched yeah. them in order of like kind of, importance Relevance. what i thought yeah, yeah like with the most which means you being probably last... watched them backwards but that's fine Might it doesn't be. matter yeah. i mean i did try to follow that this was posted seven days ago this was posted five days ago you know yeah so try to Kinda get like it in that. some weather order yeah, yeah sort of um then yeah then i watched cuomo and i was just i was blown away by this guy like why in the world would this guy get in front of everybody and talk about COVID? Right. The ball's on this guy, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> he even said something around like uh, towards the end about uh, that we've shown that our way works. And I was like, what way is that to infect a huge percentage of your population and kill off all your old people? <laughs> <Yeah, right. laughs> this is what we've done. And we've now flattened the curve. <laughs> we, flattened flattened the curve. York, we just killed everybody off. I, I was, I was amazed at I was amazed that yeah, he could stand there and do that. Um, I don't really have anything else to say about him except that like how insane that was to yeah, me. Right. Uh, the, it seems like Cuomo being the governor of the most affected state um, yeah. might just want to shy away from the COVID thing entirely. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't right? know. I, I don't know why they asked him to speak. He's somehow become a hero by being a complete failure. Yeah. Um, I mean, I well, say a complete failure, a, a complete failure in their terms. I, and I've said all along that there's no government that's going to save you from a virus. That's, yeah, but they but, made some seriously bad decisions. Yes, they did. E despite all of that. Like, yeah. I mean, you can always make things worse and it kind of feels like that's what they did. Yeah, like. <laughs> it is true. Um, then, uh, I... I watched Sanders and I watched Warren, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren's speeches. Yeah. Um, yeah I missed Warren. I watched Bernie. He didn't miss anything with Warren, actually. Yeah. She didn't really say anything. It, it wasn't. Yeah. I, I didn't. I actually, I have her on my list here, and then I crossed her out because <laughs> there was nothing. Because there. there was no nothing substance. to say about yeah. it. Yeah. It was just. Yeah. Uh, it was just a uh, you know five noise. minutes of nothing. Yeah. Um, At least it was only five minutes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, Bernie Sanders' speech was okay. Uh, there was some some weirdness in there. Um, I, I still think that it's terrible that he would get behind a Biden after all of this. Yeah. Um, I mean, he did seem to say that the, that the reason that he was behind Biden is because Trump is so bad. Yeah. Um, it, it didn't, it wasn't like he got up there and said, Biden is the greatest guy. He was like, uh, you know, yeah. Trump is such a severe threat to our democracy that we have to have somebody else in there. So let's get <laughs> this behind. This is who it is. <laughs> yeah. So let's get behind Biden yeah. this time <laughs> right. or something. Hold your nose and vote for Biden. Um, I did think he said something about Trump being authoritarian and I thought that that's rich coming from a socialist. 
Um, right. <laughs> you know, like I guess no concept of history. Yeah. Um, and then just some like it's not misinformation exactly. I I actually do think that for the most part Bernie believes what he's selling. Yeah. Um. I just think that he's wrong uh, <laughs> most of the time. Um, but he made some comment about, um, you know, promoting the $15 an hour minimum wage uh, that would raise 40 million people um, out of poverty or something like that. Yeah. And I, I was like, no, you're probably going to put 40 million people out of work. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you're, like, you're pricing these people out of the market. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so uh, we're we've talked about this plenty of times before, and this is one of those kind of uh, um, evergreen type topics that whenever we actually have time to record a couple episodes to throw in there on times when we can't get together, the minimum wage is going to be one of them. Oh, we yeah. actually have an old one. Yeah. Um, we had to edit some stuff out of it. Uh, but yeah. um, anyway, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll go into this in a lot of detail sometime or another if we haven't done it enough already. Yeah. But yeah, you raise the the price of labor and it makes some labor not worth paying. Yeah. It that's just the fact of it. And truthfully, if you wanted to reach full employment and have more people actually working, you would lower the minimum wage down to nothing. Yes. Because then you could hire it would it would open more doors for people because mm-hmm. yeah, you can say well there there would be these horrible low wage jobs. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah, well that was that'd be where they'd start. These people that wouldn't otherwise be able to get employment would be able to get this employment, and then maybe they can m- move it into a career. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's everybody has to start somewhere. And basically, with the minimum wage, the higher you make it, the the harder you make it for people that don't have these skills to get their foot in the door. Yeah, yeah. Unskilled workers become not valuable enough. Yeah. I mean, they just don't produce enough to make it worth. You're not going to hire somebody who is whose production value is less than what you're paying them. Yeah. That's just what it comes down to. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. You can't run a business that way. You can't. Yeah, exactly. You can't be profitable that way. Um, I mean, the other thing that it does, obviously, is it, like you say, it's going to bring 40 million people up to a living wage. But now everything that they buy costs more. Yeah. Because that's the flip. That's the <laughs> other side to it is that you you, shoot you raise inflation. labor costs for every business in the country. Yeah, exactly. If it worked like you wanted it to. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, anyway, so it, it was yeah. it was an OK speech, though. I mean, you know, Bernie can be kind of fun to listen to. He just, yeah. you know, he's he's passionate. He believes yeah, in what he's saying. Mm-hmm. Um, I listened to uh, Michelle Obama's speech. Uh, it was kind of meh. Yeah. Um, so that's when I was kind of literally falling asleep during like she, her voice just puts me to sleep. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe it's a, I don't know. It just does. <laughs> the, there were a couple of things that stood out to me in it. Um, one of them was that she, uh, said that Joe Biden is a profoundly decent man. <laughs> <laughs> what a roaring compliment that is. And uh, yeah, I was like, I <laughs> don't profoundly <laughs> decent. <laughs> yeah. I don't know that that's as big a compliment as you mean it to be, at least the way I understand it, like profoundly like this. So this is what I interpreted in my head when I heard it. Yeah. it was like this guy is really, really okay. Yeah, exactly. That's that's, and that's how you should <laughs> interpret it, you know? Ooh. And I, so I just, yeah. Yeah. Profoundly, profoundly decent. Profoundly decent. He's so he's, he's as, yeah. <laughs> that's just, I can't even like wrap my, that's so weird. Yeah. It's an awkward statement. It, it is. I, I'm, I can't imagine who wrote that. Um, unlike uh, Bill Clinton's speech that had some great lines in it. Um, yeah. And then the, like a lot of it was about hate and racism in this country. Yeah. I mean, that's, and really her <clears throat> and Obama's, I kind of felt like were really just kind of stirring the pot. Yeah, in, um, in a way that was is just not necessary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean he so he too yes uh, highlighted differences and division um, yeah. a, a, the same way he did when he was in office. Yeah, uh, I, I mean he he did this when he was president, so I mean that, no one should be surprised by it. But but I, it's it's there's something kind of sickening about listening to them talk about hate and racism when these are two of the more influential people in the world. Yeah. 
um, Barack Obama and Michelle Obama. Oh, without question. Um, they're very wealthy, very privileged, um, and very influential in the world. And yeah. to talk about hate and racism in a country where you guys lived in the White House for eight years, were elected and reelected, just seems, I don't know, I, I, it was just kind of sickening. Yeah. Well, and they're, if they really believed the stuff they were saying, they would be, it seems to me they would be bringing, trying to bring people together. Mm-hmm. And, and that's, that's not never what I take away from them. It's always no. division. And, yeah. and it's just not productive. It's not, gonna, it's not helping the situation. Mm-hmm. Which we're in a situation that needs a lot of help. So. Yeah. Well, and so I was talking to somebody in my office about it too, and uh, and these same kind of, kind of comments I was making to uh, to them, and they said, "Well, and we know where this, you know, where this racial division started, mm-hmm. um, and implying that it started in their their term in the White House and Barack's um, under First. Barack's administration." Yeah. And I, I said um, that I. Th- I think that you're right that it yeah. did start with the Barack Obama administration that we were in a fairly good place I think in terms of racial not harmony exactly but yeah. um you know in race relations in this country uh when Obama was elected and that it went downhill from there yeah. um and it's gone downhill further for Trump and the thing is though I don't blame the Obamas and yeah. I don't dr- blame Trump I it's the media that has done this it's it's the media influence that has increased racial tensions in this country oh, and it's yeah. because they are pushing for the drama because the drama gets clicks or views or whatever that drives up their advertising revenue and that's really what it's about so if you can create this drama even if you're creating it out of nothing it's yeah. worthwhile to the news sources that's true and I, I do blame the media for the increase in racial tensions. Yeah. And I think it's, I mean, they're, they're definitely more complicit than anybody else, I would say, at the mm-hmm. least. Yeah. And, and just like you say, I mean, they may be fully responsible. Mm-hmm. So. Um, Barack's speech was okay. Yeah. Uh, it was on, a, on an Obama scale, on a Barack Obama scale, it was kind of disappointing, <laughs> yeah. actually. Because um, yeah. he is generally and genuinely a very good speaker. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It just seemed kind of flat to mm-hmm. me. And it may be, again, that there's no audience. He's it's, just talking to a camera. Yeah. Uh, I'm I, I not think sure, it's but, the COVID effect, man. Yeah. Um, there was, he kind of highlighted the difference between his handling of H1N1 and Trump's handling of uh, yeah. coronavirus, which I thought, I thought that was, was special. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought that was kind of funny. For those that aren't aware, um, the H1N1 infection numbers, uh, while not as bad as the COVID numbers, um, were bad enough that they stopped counting. Yeah, uh, that the that the Obama administration, administration stopped stopped counting stopped counting yeah. uh, H1N1 infections. Yeah. So. Um, I don't know. I, I, you know, I, I just thought that that was funny, kind oh, of ironic. Can you imagine if, if the Trump administration came out? We're just going to quit collecting these numbers. Yeah, this data looks bad. Let's we're going to stop. We're just going to stop gonna collecting. Stop counting. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, they, you know, media's created an uproar every time they say that they're changing how they're reporting stuff, even if it's like, well, you got to go through this different department to get the same set of numbers now. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so anyway, um, and then, but one thing that really bugged me about Barack Obama's speech is that he kept referring to this country, to the United States as, um, as a democracy, uh. democracy, <laughs> democracy, 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 democracy. Supposedly, this guy's a constitutional lawyer, right? Yeah. Isn't that, isn't yeah, that what I've been told? That's what I've been told. Yeah. But. Um, so surely he knows that, I, I mean, presumably in your education to become a constitutional attorney, uh, you would be asked to read the documents of the Founding Fathers where they very explicitly and pointedly made sure that they did not create a democracy <laughs> and explained exactly why they were afraid of democratic rule. Yeah. Um, this is a republic. Yeah. Constitutional Republic. <laughs> and I would really hope that a guy that lived in the White House for eight years knows With- that. <laughs> and so, and I'm sure that he does. I'm sure he does too. And so then that brings up the question, like, why repeatedly mischaracterize the F- U.S. federal government as a democracy? It's because that's what they, in the end, that's what they want. Exactly. I mean, that's that's what it boils down to. 
Yeah, because it's it's much easier to influence a majority. Yep. Um, and mob rule is scary, but not if you're winning, I guess. Exactly. And mob the, can turn, the, though, so I don't know why they want it either. Um, <laughs> right. But they're not thinking that far down the road. Exactly. You know, And this comes back to one of those things that has been a theme in the democracy, the God that failed, yeah. um, is that... It, the the private versus public ownership of government, you know, the private ownership being a monarchy, public ownership being a, a democracy or a democratic republic. Yeah. Um, and uh, he says, if you are, um, if you actually own the government in the sense of a monarchy where it, this is yours for life and it's something that you can pass on and like state assets or something that you control, can sell, can yeah. buy, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. um, that you take more care in them. It, it turns into the tragedy of the commons when it's when it's public, mm -hmm. um, and so in a president isn't really an owner of the government; they're just a caretaker. Yeah, and they only can generate any value out of their position for as long as they're in that position. So there's no um, incentive, incentive to, to do a good job. Yeah, there's yeah. no incentive to to build it. Yeah. Because you don't get to reap the benefits the next guy does. Yeah. So the best thing to do is to use up as much as you can while you're in office. And it gets even worse than that because a lot of times the writing's on the wall that your team isn't going to be the next guy. Yeah. I mean, so often it's, you know, well, the Democrats are fixing to take over, so mm -hmm. we better just like, yeah. we can blame all of this on them later <laughs> if we just screw it up now. Yeah. Generally you speaking, know. you get your eight years. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. And um, I mean, the exception in my lifetime is the um, uh, Bush the Elder being elected. Yeah. But he only got one term because people were tired of the 12 years of the Reagan-Bush era. Right? <laughs> exactly. Um, we got Clinton. Yep. Um, so anyway, yeah, him repeatedly referring to uh, the U.S. government as a democracy like really got to me. Yeah. Um, 20 uh, minutes, he must have said it 30 times. Yeah. And, um, it's not just him. I mean, uh, there's plenty of them that do the same thing. That's true. Um, which makes you wonder if that's not some kind of talking point that they're, that's being taken from somewhere else. Oh, I'm sure that it is. I, I would, I yeah. would imagine it has to be. Mm -hmm. Um, so now to the Clintons, I guess. Uh, Hillary's speech, meh. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Blame I'm, Russia. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's just that she's so unlikable. Yeah. I, I'm not sure, but I just, you know, whatever. But one of the things that she talked about uh, in terms of how great Biden was is how well he's cared for his family. Yeah. And and I, I thought, what part of the family are you talking about? Um, <laughs> because, you know, Hunter uh, had real serious uh, substance abuse problems. Yeah. Um, and I don't fault him particularly for that. I mean, it happens, right? Yeah. But um, part of the reason probably that he suffered so much under it is because of his father's draconian, you know, <laughs> anti-drug policy, <laughs> right. where he couldn't come forward and deal with it as a as a medical problem. Yeah. Um, and so, I, you know, maybe I'm reading too much into that, but maybe not. And then, of course, Bo, um, Bo died of brain cancer that he got from his time in Iraq yeah. that his father promoted. Yeah, yeah, um, basically sent him to... You know, like, I think that you could make a pretty strong case that, that Joe Biden killed one of his sons. <laughs> yeah, well... <laughs> um, not directly, but yeah. uh, through his own policies. Yeah. And made life very difficult for the other through his policies. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so... That's an interesting way to look at it. I didn't really consider all of that when... Well, you know, you know and so then I thought, well, if we're electing him on how well he's cared for his family and how he thinks of all of the rest of us as his family, too, I'm like, I don't want Ooh, this guy in yeah, office. Yeah, I don't yet. want you in my family. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm going to uh, emancipate myself. Yeah. Um, Bill, Bill gave a good speech. Yeah. Um, I, you know, it was there were a couple of lines in there. And the, like the substance of it wasn't really that great, but he just he just delivered a he good speech. He knows how to deliver. Yeah, I mean, um, there was a line in there about um, Trump denying, distracting, and demeaning, and <laughs> I got a, a little chuckle out of that. And then he yeah. ended it with uh, that uh, all he does is blame, bully, and belittle. And I thought that was a great <laughs> line too. I mean, right. it's just like he got the alliteration going. He he delivered it very well. Yeah. Um, I don't really have, like I said, I don't really have much to say about the substance of the speech, but it was, 
it was entertaining and it was it was, it was well done. It was delivered well. Yeah. yeah. Um, Kamala's speech, uh, <laughs> you know, I thought maybe it's not a great idea to invoke um, Hillary Clinton's power. Yeah. Maybe um, when you're, you know, when you're identifying people who have had an impact on the world that maybe Hillary, if you're trying to draw a parallel, yeah. like maybe Hillary's not the person you want to pick. <laughs> um, so that was, that was strange. All in all, I thought hers was a good speech, uh, except for that she had a real lip smack problem. Um, there oh, was yeah. a lot of, a lot of lip smack and then she might've just been nervous up there. I don't, I don't know. I mean, it happens. Maybe she got high before she got up there. And so she had the cotton mouth <laughs> and cotton mouth and on yeah. stage. Um, hard to well, say my, my take from her though, the whole time has been, she's not really a good public speaker, um, which has been interesting because that's something that the media seems to praise her on. Mm -hmm. And they also praise her for her debating ability. Yeah. And once again, not impressed, man. Like, even if I was on her side, she ain't really got a good track record. <laughs> no, I, I concur. I, um, I just don't yeah, see it. Yeah, I, I agree. I do, however, think that she seems to be a very good politician. Yeah. Um, she seems to have a, an understanding of which way the wind's blowing and, and set up her direction. sails in the right way. Yeah. yeah. She, um, I don't know how much of what she promotes she actually believes, yeah. uh, but she knows what things to get behind to get people on her side. Yeah. It seems to me. Yeah. Um, there, she did say something about uh, her mom raised her to be a strong black woman, which I thought was strange for two reasons. Um, mostly it was because her mom is Indian. <laughs> well... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, and, uh, so it, it seems odd to me that her mom would raise her to be a strong black woman. Her dad left when she was five. So the, the, uh, like the Jamaican That's man the in her house was work. gone. <laughs> yeah. Um, and her mom is Indian. So I don't know. So we're it's still just, embracing that heritage even though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Even though you're identifying the wrong parent is teaching you those things. I don't know. It was, it was just a little weird. Cause she had just said that her dad left when. You know, her dad oh, so was she Jamaican. followed one up with the other? Yeah, yeah. She just <laughs> said that her, her dad was Jamaican and her mom was Indian and her dad left when she was five. And, you know, mom was really good to me and my sister and raised us to be strong black women. And I just, <laughs> I was like, wait, what? No, some of these things don't go together. <laughs> it's, how did she know how to be a strong black woman? Yeah, right. Uh, that was my, my initial question. Um, and then uh, there was some talk about how the virus was racist uh, oh yeah, I forgot about that. There was a bunch of that in the DNC. Yeah, is the, that racist virus that's attacking um, black and brown people more than anybody else. And uh, okay, so there's there's truth in the numbers there. Yeah. Um, but the virus doesn't care what color you are. Now there yeah. could be some uh, you know corollary things that are related to race that that affect how well, um, well you survive the virus. I mean, there like I've, a lot of viruses have can have significantly different different impacts on people with different genetic codes yeah right well there's that and there's also you know some like i mean in the hypertension and some of this other stuff pretty prevalent in the black community I yeah mean, and that, um diabetes is diabetes, also a big one that's the one i was trying to pull yeah but yeah. i knew there was a couple of factors mm -hmm. that that could play into that and i mean that's just a lot of that comes down to just, you know, who you are and what you have and how you take care of yourself. Yeah, because, no, no, no. There's no way that behavior has anything to do with <laughs> we it. We can't blame behavior, right? Yeah. <laughs> There's no way that behavior has anything to do with it. And I don't know why you wouldn't just bring up that maybe it's attacking poor people. Yeah. Uh, well, that maybe and, poor people have it worse. Yeah. And and the, the, the higher number of poor people in urban environments where people are on top of each other and it's easier to transmit something like a virus yeah. are black. Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, more of the, uh, uh, rural poor population is white. Yeah. So, uh, where, but you know, then you have, then you have natural social distancing. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. Um, but, uh, anyway, I just thought that, that was odd. It was such a weird thing. Well, I mean, we'll get that to that, I suppose, when we talk about it, just like sum up. Yeah. Um, and we're well into this and 
we may run long tonight. There was so much that happened. Well, it's, we we missed a week. We're we're behind. Yeah. Um. Then she like there was very little foreign policy talk in the DNC. Yeah. In fact, I, I would highlight that as something that was really noticeable by how it wasn't addressed. Um, was the the war state. Yeah. Uh, but she did give a little sign to her hawkish foreign policy in her speech where she said um, something along the lines of uh, to, of promoting American values around the world, um, stand by our allies and stand up to our adversaries. Yeah, um, kind of a wink and a nudge. Yeah, um, yeah. that we're going to maintain this, we've got to control everything everywhere. Yeah. Um, and adversaries actually just means economic adversaries at this point. Yeah. Like the, our adversaries are Russia and China. Um, and it's mostly because they don't, you know, uh, what, b- what's the popular phrase now? Thanks to game of Thrones, won't bend the knee to the American <laughs> empire. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and China is, uh, it's hard to say it's an economic powerhouse cause it has holes in it the same as our economy, but, yeah. um, that they are an economy that can challenge the U S economy. Yeah. Um, Russians less so, but the Russians have, uh, and actually not even their military can challenge the U S military when it comes down to it. But, um, but they do have several thousand, uh, H bombs. So uh, (laughs) there's always that. (laughs) Yeah. Um, so anyway, that one, that, line obviously turned me off i mean i knew something like that was coming i was actually a little surprised that it took so long into the dnc before anybody really made um i mean other than the republicans that were speaking at the dnc made any kind of comments that really suggested what direction their foreign policy would go yeah um and then finally uh finally there was biden yeah um i watched the speech a couple of times actually yeah he, um, it wasn't bad for him. Well, I was going to say, I mean, <laughs> he didn't, he didn't like wander off. He didn't like yeah. <laughs> forget I mean, his lines or, well, I, he's just, this was probably sharp. take 40. Well, yeah. Can you imagine how many times they went through it? Well, at some point though, like going through it even more is even worse. Like, yeah. You've dealt with somebody with dementia. Well, and there were some places where he stumbled and some things that he said wrong. And like, clearly there was a point in there where we're like, we're not doing this again. Just yeah. Like, this yeah. is as good as it's going to get <laughs> yeah. guys. Like yeah. this is the best. We, we've recorded this 30 times yeah. and this is the best one. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I could be wrong about that, but that's what I would assume. Yeah. It, and it kind of felt that way. It like, sure I wasn't mean, delivered live. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, I, there were some things in there that just, uh, let's just start with the, the lies that he invoked. Okay. Um, Russian bounties. Seriously, oh, that has yeah. been absolutely debunked. Yeah, <laughs> um, but he's you know made some comment about that uh, that he would respond when the Russians put bounties on our soldiers yeah. or something like that. Well, you know, unlike Trump, and but the Russians didn't put bounties on our soldiers. That's <laughs> like. All right. Um, and, and how about if they weren't over there, we wouldn't have that problem. Well, there's how about also that. that? Like, <laughs> <laughs> They're getting right to it there, Gary. I yeah, appreciate I was that. Just saying. Um he also invoked the Charlotte's Charlottesville thing, the yes, you know, there were um good people on all sides or what I don't even remember what yeah, the stupid line is that was taken completely out of context. It, and, that, that's pretty well lit, yeah. Um and uh I mean at least he didn't go as far as uh what's her name? Yamish on uh PBS that uh-huh. said that Trump said that there were um, good people in the white supremacist movement or something like <laughs> yeah, she, right? Like, she just like just really went all the way with it. it yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean this, this comment has, doesn't mean anything close to what it has been represented as. Well, I mean, he said that he was talking about the people that were there, um, protesting the statues yeah. up or down. Yeah. And he said there are very, very fine people. Well, that was the thing. Very fine people on both sides. And he said, before he even made that comment, he said, now I'm not talking about the Nazis, the, the well, neo-Nazis, the white supremacists or whatever, but... Um, yeah. And then anyway. he clarified it again after because yeah. they, the, the reporter asked him, are you talking about the, the white supremacist? And he was like, no, I'm talking about the people that are there to protest the statues coming down and going up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, like, he very... I mean, it was... 
if you go back and listen, you almost can't listen to it without hearing it be clarified in the moment. Yeah. So yeah, G- listen to two minutes instead of fifteen seconds. Yeah, yeah. Because that's uh, just, just listen to the two minutes of that instead yeah. of the fifteen seconds, and you will there's, be dispelled of the stupid. There's myth. no question what he meant by that. Yeah. So um, he also uh, said that um, that the U.S. is the worst performing nation uh, in terms of COVID. Uh, yeah. And. Um, and he actually said, you know, you don't have this problem in Canada, Europe, or Japan. Um, I had a little trouble kind of sussing this out because Europe isn't a isn't a country. Oh yeah. Uh, so like, there's a bunch of bunch of countries, countries that go together, into yeah. it. But um, so the it, it depends on how you look at it. Yeah. Um, the U.S. has the most deaths of well, not of all of Europe, but I don't think, but uh, of any particular country in Europe, yeah. um, more deaths than Canada, more deaths than Japan. This is true. Okay. Um, the U S is also much bigger than any of those countries. Yeah. <laughs> much bigger. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the, uh, if you look at, uh, fatality rates, um, the U S is about 3%, uh, fatality rate. This is as of yesterday, by the way, like I checked these yeah. CDC so these numbers are like today. Current numbers. Yeah. yeah. Um, Canada's uh, fatality rate is roughly 7%, more than twice that of the U.S. Yeah. Um, and they have a lower number of infections per 100,000, but it's a much more sparsely populated. I was going to say, they're, they're naturally socially distancing. Exactly. <laughs> um, Europe, I mean, I don't know. It, so I, I went through uh, the list. I just tried to sort it and see who was above and below the U.S. out of the European countries. Um it, it turns out that Austria has a lower fatality rate than the U.S. Oh, yeah. Every other European nation has a higher fatality rate than the U.S. Wow. Every other one. <laughs> All right. Um, and, this, and remember, bearing in mind, uh, well, yeah, bearing in mind that the CDC just came out and said that the uh, infection rates um, were higher than they probably actually were, yeah. um, and that the, there are only roughly 6% of the deaths in the U S that didn't have comorbidities. And the average number of comorbidities was two and a half. Um, so like I I was talking with another friend at work uh, about this and we were just trying to suss out the data a little bit and like, you know, because the, the list of things that were, uh, listed as comorbidities were some of the biggest killers on their own. Yeah. Um, so you're having heart disease listed as a comorbidity. Well, heart disease is already the biggest killer in the U S yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. And, uh, you know, and then there were some things that were just absurd. Like you wouldn't even, why would COVID have anything to do with it? Where you had like, um, accidents and self-inflicted, uh, harm and so forth. Like they're counting suicides as COVID deaths or, <laughs> I, I mean, well, there, there could be an argument for that. I was fixed to say, uh, I was fixing to try to make one. So, yeah. um, but, Seriously. Well, yeah. I mean, you wouldn't count it as a COVID death, but I mean, Mm -hmm. I do believe that the suicide rates are probably higher because of the lockdowns and people losing their jobs and things like that. Yeah. And if they find them and they have uh, COVID, they're apparently counting it as a (laughs) COVID death. That's insane. Well, I mean, you remember the one that, like, the guy was in a motorcycle accident. Yeah. um, And they counted it as a COVID death. And I was like, well, I mean, you could make the argument, right? Like, maybe he had went into a coughing fit at just the wrong time, and that's what caused him to crash the motorcycle. But that's not a COVID death. I'm sorry. Um, I have that fear every time I sneeze when I'm driving. Yeah. So there's no way to know how many of these deaths would have occurred without COVID. Yeah. Um, and how many of them would not have occurred if it weren't for COVID. I mean, it's hard to say. But, uh, you know, my my friend and I playing with the data um, came to a number that is roughly between 30 and 40 percent of the reported COVID deaths probably are actually COVID. COVID is probably the responsible the, party. Right. Yeah. Um, so that still puts our uh, our um, death numbers down to like seventy to eighty thousand. Yeah. Um, which actually puts us in really good shape compared to everybody else. But <laughs> anyway, my my point being that like these numbers are already inflated, and we're still beating these other countries, it, depending on how you're measuring. Yeah. Um, and I think that fatality rates and uh, deaths per hundred thousand is a really much better way of measuring than total deaths yeah. um, because it's not representative. Um, always convert to per hundred thousand. So 
in Europe, uh, the, every country had higher fatality rates, and Belgium, which is the seat of the European Union, um, has an 11.5% fatality rate, and deaths were uh, 86 per 100,000. Uh, yeah. Better than 86. It was like 86.5 per 100,000. We're at about um, 50 some, 55, I think, yeah. which is much higher than it was when I reported on this stuff months ago. Yeah. Um, but still, we're like... Based on these figures, we haven't been outperformed by every country in the world. Now, yeah. the Japan thing is a good point. They have lower yeah. fatality rates and lower deaths per 100,000. They've, yeah. they've managed it, obviously, well, better. Or they've gotten lucky. Well, no. Or are they just a healthier people? Well, because, that could be it, too. Because that I think you find that that's a lot to do with the COVID deaths, like we were talking about with the racial thing. Mm -hmm. Like it, it, A lot of it just has to do with your health. Yeah. Like, I mean, if you're already in poor health, your this virus can devastate you. Yeah, their obesity rates are way below. The well, you, US I just picture rates. Japanese or yeah, Japanese in my head, and they yeah. just I picture a healthy looking person. Yeah, <laughs> like I, don't, I don't picture a, a not healthy. I mean, that's just my Even bias. Even those big old sumo guys are like yeah, pretty I good mean, shape. They're pretty good shape for their size. Yeah. <laughs> they um, wear it well. So. Anyway, th these are just some of the things that I like. I was calling BS on yeah. um, when he was talking about them, and of course, uh, the his thing about COVID was um, that he was gonna he was gonna get it under control, yeah. and that oh, I love here's, these kind of speeches. Oh, from. here's what scares me though. Mm -hmm. So yeah, his way of getting it under control. We're talking about the government stepping in. So we're talking about mandatory mask. We're talking about maybe reinstating lockdowns. Like that's in his mind, what we're going to do to get this thing under control. And that's the last thing we want now, especially given the current situation on the streets as it is. Yeah. Like the last thing we need to be doing is locking people down. Well, we're one of the few countries that don't have massive riots right now about, or massive protests about uh, the uh, about well, lockdowns. That's a good point because I was watching some foreign news the other day and mm -hmm. all over the world they're, 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 protesting over mask and over lockdowns. Yes. And like I say, I mean, our people are on the streets, but it's for something else. Yeah. But, you know, but they were, people were, these, this stuff was already starting to come about in this country before the lockdowns ended. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were already armed <clears throat> protests for the lockdowns when they started to fade out. Yeah. Uh, we just kind of transitioned that into Black Lives Matter. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, you got to have some reason to get out there on the street. I guess, yeah. Well, um, but that goes back to, you know, you start locking people down. You, I mean, going out and protesting is a way to get out of the house. I can't go to Disney World, but I can go protest. Yeah. <laughs> well, and he also said uh, that day one um, that he was going to, we were going to develop and deploy a rapid test, and we were going to make all the personal protective equipment that we needed like he's the Fonz and he's just going to snap his like fingers and all this have, stuff's going to happen well yeah I mean as far as the rapid test <clears> goes <throat> I don't know where they're at with developing that but mm -hmm. I don't feel like <laughs> I feel like if that was like a thing it would already be a thing yeah <laughs> um, and then uh, he made this comment this uh, let me uh, actually just say right now um, that while I have been opposed to uh, the government response to the COVID stuff um, throughout and been vocally opposed on this podcast to what they've done. Um, and that I have, that it is my feeling and I've tried to support here, um, that the, the claims about the seriousness of the illness are exaggerated, um, et cetera. Like all that's actually like that part of it is actually irrelevant. Yeah. Um, in the end, the, my problem with the, uh, the government response isn't that I think that the, um, that the seriousness is exaggerated. It's that people should be able, people should be free to make their own risk assessments. Yeah, absolutely. That's what it comes down to. It's about, it's about choice. It's about voluntarism. It's not really about how serious the virus is. It's about you put the information out there and you let people make their own risk assessments. Absolutely. And, and that's, I mean, that's been my position this whole time too. I mean, that's, that's, that's where the, let people decide for themselves. If it mm -hmm. really is as dangerous as you say it is, people will see that and they and stay will, home and they will do what they need to do to protect themselves. Yes. I but mean, you don't have to destroy the economy. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. Know, by force. Yeah. Um, so then he says, uh, we need a tax code that rewards 
Uh, we don't need a tax code that rewards wealth more than work. And I was like, you know, I agree with that. Of course, you know, ideally, uh, we would have no tax code at all. Yeah. And this is what I would say to him, is that the only people that the tax code rewards are the people that are politically connected. Yeah. Oh, without question. <laughs> right. There, There's no way that a tax code... Re I mean, we don't want a tax code that rewards wealth more than work, but the truth is the tax code doesn't reward anybody but the politically connected. There yeah. is no there is no reward for a tax code yeah. um, to yeah. most people. Yeah. It, it is nothing but a detriment. It's, yeah, I was going to say, it's doing nothing but taking money out of my pocket. Yeah, we were talking with those people at the restaurant the other night and uh, yeah. about the taxation is theft thing. And they'd say, well, you know, if, if all these things are actually so important to my life, then I should be free to choose whether I give you money for it or not. And if it's really so important to my life, I'll give you money for it. Yeah. Uh, you know, if I could just keep the portion of my taxes that goes to things that I don't believe in, yeah. then that would be great. But they wouldn't get much money out of me. Like blowing it up in the Middle East. Yeah. Literally blowing yeah. my tax dollars up. Yeah. <laughs> A quarter of my taxes. Yeah. Burned halfway just, around the world. Yeah. For yeah. nothing. Um. And then, uh, I don't know, just... I don't think that it was a very good speech. It wasn't very interesting. It was kind of boring, but... Um, but he got through it. But he, yeah, but he got through it. And it wasn't bad on a Biden scale. And um, there was a thing that he kept going back to this uh, light and dark. Yeah. Light and dark. And I'm on the side of light. And I'm against the dark. And I thought, man, that seems really tone deaf right now. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, so I said the... Ex I'm glad you said that, too, because I said the exact same thing. I was like, man, like, he's walking a line. If Trump gave this speech, can you imagine? <laughs> oh, I know. Can you imagine? <laughs> I'm on the side of the light. <laughs> and, um, and, and just one more comment on his speech, uh, it, because I want you all to remember this, because we're going to go into this in more detail on another topic sometime later. Um, which is uh, what he brought up a couple of times. And it came up throughout the, the DNC, actually, is that we want to build back better. Yeah. Build back better. Remember that phrase, because it is everywhere. And it originated at the UN and the World Economic Forum. So this is about world government. Yeah. And, um, and I, will, I will make the case to you in some future episode. Uh, because I already have like a folder full of clips. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> anyway, just remember that one. That this build is back better. Build back better. That the the DNC is the is promoting the world government, is and the, that's what the, the COVID thing is, I mean, and the um and, and you know, and we've made the case that that's what the uh, uh, climate change thing is. Yeah. That you create these problems that no single government could tackle on their own. Um, and with the goal of giving the power to control those things to some supranational government and then feeding more power into it once you've got it established. Exactly. Which is the most dangerous thing <clears throat> as far for us as libertarians. I mean, that's a, that's a government. Yeah. There is no government more further away. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> At least to date. <laughs> Self-government. That's what we want. Self-government. Yes. Um, now, so to sum up. Uh, the, the DNC was about, um, how terrible Trump is, uh, how authoritarian he is. And what we're going to do is we're going to make you all do something else. So it's like our authoritarianism versus his th authoritarianism. That's <laughs> yeah. what I got out of it. The post office came up over and over and over oh, again. They man. kept talking about the post office. Like the world could not exist without the U S postal <laughs> service. Um, <laughs> And yeah, come on. Well, that uh, was, and that just happened to be the attack on Trump of the week. Yeah. Like that was, that was that week's heaven attack. For, yeah. Heaven forbid we should dismantle a single government <laughs> enterprise. Program, yeah. yeah. Um, and of course, uh, peaceful protests. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They didn't actually talk about riots at all. Period. Yeah. Um, uh, bigotry. Uh, like I said, they didn't really talk about war. Um, or foreign policy to any real degree. Um, and then, uh, oh, and no matter what vote, please, everybody yeah. just get out there and vote. <laughs> it, it doesn't matter how much you know about politics. Just go out there and vote. Vote and, like oh, your lives depend on it yeah. because they very much do. Yeah. Wasn't that like a, this is the most Michelle important Obama election quote? ever. Yeah, yes, right? of course it always <laughs> is. Um, and then uh, they kept harping on lost jobs and lost lives. And I thought that that was really strange, too, because uh, the lost jobs are a result. I mean, Trump didn't want to shut down. Yeah. Right. So this was a no win for him. 
so he didn't want to shut down, and then they blame him for the lost lives. Yeah. And then he does shut down, and then they blame him for the lost jobs. Yeah. And actually, most of the lost jobs and lost lives tend well, to be in liberal control but in the end of the, states what, and cities. At the end of the day, what ended up happening, though, is Trump didn't really do anything as far as a shutdown. That's the, true. The states did that on their own. Exactly. Um, so, I mean, any of that you want to attribute, you attribute to the, whichever state you're referring to. Yeah. Because he, he did. He left that up to the governors. Which are mostly Democrat controlled, the ones that shut down. The ones that shut down, exactly. Yeah. Um, so it, it was, I found it really interesting that they blamed him both for lost jobs and lost lives. Yeah. Well, it I was going to be one or the other. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, if the government's going to react, it's yeah. well, yeah. actually whether the government reacts or not. Yeah. One of these things is going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> so. I mean, I don't know. I just, uh, it, I mean, it's obviously a way of demonizing him. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I, just Gosh, seem- I have to keep saying this over and over again. I'm no big fan of Trump, but your government cannot protect you from a virus. Yeah. Um, your government can not forcibly put you out of work. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and well, and he didn't really do that. No, he didn't. And and I'm telling you, Biden was pretty open about that's what he would do. Yeah. Um, which, like I say, that scares me, man. Like that. Because it's one thing for your governors to do it, and I disagree with that. But for it to come from the top, like mm-hmm. that's a scary thing to me. Yeah. So. Well, um, we're already over an hour here. I was going to say, wanna... I know we're way over time because I'm getting very uncomfortable in this chair. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Not that I was comfortable <laughs> before, but like I can tell we've been here a minute. <laughs> There's alternatives. I know. Chairs. You're just too lazy to bring one back here. It's, it's not that. I'd be uncomfortable. I don't sit. Like, sitting's not my thing, man. Well, do you want to talk briefly about the shootings and these couple of little I think foreign we, policy I, I things? I do. And, um, okay. I mean, I still want to do that. All right. I just want the record to show that I am uncomfortable. <laughs> okay. So noted. <laughs> Duly noted. <laughs> yeah. um, all right. Well, uh, Let's hit the foreign policy stuff anyway, because I, I keep harping on the fact that they didn't talk about foreign policy. Yeah. Um, so these are just a, a couple of things that I found interesting. Um, they don't require a whole lot of, I mean, Discussion. go look it up. Yeah. yeah. It, cause, and I'm going to tell you what my conclusion is, but you can go form your own. <laughs> um <laughs> The uh, like a week ago, maybe 10 days ago now, um, the U.S. offered to remove Sudan from its international terror list if the Sudan, uh, if the Sudanese government would just pay the um, U.S. and it was supposed to go into some kind of victims fund or something like that. Three hundred million dollars for three hundred million dollars will take you off the terror list. Yeah. And so um, I thought that that really calls into question the legitimacy of the terror list, doesn't it? Well, that's like what, if you can just buy your way off of it. Yeah. Like um, how how important is this list? And yeah, like how like meaningful? Why yeah. that dollar amount would be my question. Yeah. What if it was like two ninety nine 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 nine? Yeah, it's kind <laughs> of a pittance in terms of government spending, really. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, all it'll hurt is the Sudanese people. Well, was gonna, They're the I ones that end say, up having to pay it. As far, I mean, it, that's a that's not much in our money, but in yeah. Sudanese money, like, is that a lot for their government? Um, like, can their government afford that? I mean, they would probably have to take a few extra dollars from some people. I don't yeah. know. Raise taxes? Um, I, I'm not real familiar with the Sudanese I mean, economic situation. Me either, uh, they, so. they, you know, we've been involved with a war there after we managed to split up the country for a while. Yeah. I mean, there's there's issues. Yeah. So, um you know, but it's not gonna it's not gonna hurt terrorism in the country. Yeah. Uh, in fact, it may make it worse because you drive more people into poverty potentially. I guess if yeah. depending on I mean, how much of a hardship money out it of is. Their yeah. Economy. Yeah. Um. So anyway, I just thought it was interesting. Main thing is, like I said, it just draws into question the legitimacy of the terror list to begin with. Because yeah. if you can buy the way your way off of it, how meaningful is it really to be on it? Exactly. Um. And then, uh, then today, I woke up to news of uh, the U.S. government was sanctioning the International Criminal Court, um, or sanctioning members, the you know leading members of the International Criminal Court, um, as a retaliation for them investigating U.S. war crimes in the Middle East. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Um, and there was also mention of. Uh, they're um, pressing the issue about the Israeli illegal occupation of uh, Palestinian land. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and it was Pompeo that did it. And he's one of the 
one of the chief Zionist, you know, neocons in the administration right now. Um, but uh, anyway, like the International Criminal Court, now to be fair, the U.S. never signed on to the agreement with the International Criminal Court. Um, we've been, a, as a country, our government has been opposed to it from the beginning. Um, but this is one of those situations where it strikes me as one of those um, one one rule for me, another for the yeah. kind of situations. And uh, I think it's interesting that we use our power over money um, to try and end a uh, the um, enforcement of international law against our own military, <laughs> <laughs> right? And the Israelis. Yeah. Um, and that's you know that's what I had about that. Uh, you want to just like give a quick overview of the shooting things? Um, I don't know which ones had you. I mean, there's God, there's been so many now. Well, there has been so I many. Mean, I didn't want to address the the police ones. Um, uh, <clears throat> so mostly I was thinking about that kid in Kenosha. The Rittenhouse. Yeah. So the Rittenhouse shooting. And yeah. the one in Portland, um, the guy that was shot in the chest on the street. Uh, trying to think if I even know about that one. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I, I can go over that one briefly. I mean, I, I watched the video. Um, and it was one of these things that happened after uh, a bunch of people came in um, to counter protest the yeah. black lives matter protests or, you know, Trump supporters came in, um, to counter protest. And apparently this guy was a member of the something prayer, prayer, something, I don't know. Patriot prayer, Patriot, some prayer, Patriot, prayer, Patriot, Patriot prayer. I don't know. Something well, they were, like they that. were a Patriot group. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I mean, there's been talk about, you know, whether he was harassing protesters earlier in the evening and so forth, but, on the video, uh, what you see is um, some guy yelling, hey, we got a Trump supporter right here. We got a Trumper right here. And this other guy walks up and he says, uh, this guy, and he's like, yeah, right here. Bang, bang, shoots him in the chest and walks away. Wow. Wow. Um, and so I don't know how you could make a case that this was anything other than a politically motivated murder. He's a Trump supporter. Okay, shoot him. Then shoot him, yeah. Um, which is... It's it's kind of amazing to me that we've gotten to this point. Um, well, now and there's the guy that is implicated in the shooting. There's been some talk from his family that he's not uh, that great a person. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, which surprise. Well, I mean, I guess and that kind of goes back to the the written house one, the one you were talking about with the kid. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the, he shot three people, and they one was a pedophile, and one was I don't know. They all had records. Like, yeah, they were, I think one of them there was a question about whether the record was really a record because one of them was like yeah. a EMT or something too. Oh, I missed that. I, so um, I haven't seen. I that. think I you know I don't um, remember. I this is all right. So this is the point that I would like to make about that though. Like all of their backgrounds, I shouldn't have even brought it up. All yeah. their backgrounds are completely irrelevant. Well, it is. It is. I, I would agree with you there. But at the same time, it does kind of throw you that all of the people out at these things aren't exactly good people. <laughs> well, that's I mean, probably true. Um, and, um, and, they're, and something else is they're not the most educated people on the issues that oh, they're no. out there to talk about. No, that's and true. that kind of brings me to the Rand Paul thing, mm -hmm. which is something that I did want to mention, is that so Rand Paul was attacked after the RNC, mm -hmm. um, I guess, well, a few days ago, whenever it ended, and um, by a group of protesters that were, believe me, if they could have got their hands on him, they would have mm -hmm. and gotten him and his wife to the ground, they probably would have killed him. Yeah, this was on the streets of D.C. This too, is on right? the streets of D.C. Yeah. yeah, they were literally leaving the White House to go to their hotel, mm -hmm. and they were attacked by this mob. And the the thing, and so that's bad enough. Like mm -hmm. that's okay, that's a problem. But the thing they were attacking him on was Brenda Taylor. They Brianna. Kept, Brianna Taylor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, like, he literally wrote the bill to end no-knock raids. Yeah. Like, and called it the Brianna Taylor bill or whatever. And called it the Brianna Taylor bill. Yeah. And they're mocking him and attacking him over this. Mm -hmm. And it's... Well, no, they were mocking him and attacking him, not over doing no, that. No, because, yeah, yeah not over writing the bill. <laughs> they had no clue that he wrote yeah. this bill. I so heard them like, say her name, say her name. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and it's... And, 
like so the ignorance of some of the people out there is really insane and it's scary mm -hmm. that the so the only reason they were attacking him was because he was a Republican. Yeah. Like that's that's what that's that's all they know is Republican bad. Mm -hmm. And that's and they and they would like I say uh, they it, at the least, if the police hadn't have been there, they would have seriously injured him and his wife. Yeah. Um. And it's just so it's scary to think that that's kind of where we're at in this country right now, mm -hmm. and to think that things can't get worse from here, I, I worry because I the next step to me as far as what I can see happening is that you're going to end up with a bunch of armed militia groups because the police aren't stopping these protests and these riots and these mm -hmm. things. And I say protest, but I mean riots. Yeah. Um, and well, they're two separate things. They're two separate things. And the mm -hmm. riots are the problem and the mm -hmm. police aren't doing anything about it. And so you're going to start seeing more armed people in general. Mm -hmm. Some of them are going to be paramilitary type groups mm -hmm. Um and all it's going to take is for one of these groups to have an altercation with law enforcement where a few p dozen people die from either side mm -hmm. and it's going to get really bad in this country. You're yeah. you're going to hit a point where good police that support the second amendment are going to start walking off the force and you're going to be left with the rest of the police yeah. and you're going to end up with viol like serious violence in the street like we haven't seen. Mm -hmm. Well, and um I want to come. I want to come back to that. Okay. Um, so let's backtrack a little bit and look at some of the differences between the Portland and the Kenosha shooting. Okay. Um, so in Portland, and this is my impression of this is, and I'm this is from watching videos. Okay. Actually, no. So um, in Portland, uh, you have, and I don't know whether the guy that was shot was armed or yeah. not. Um, but at any rate, you have a guy saying uh, this guy's a Trump supporter. Yeah. And he shoots him in the chest. Guy turns around, takes two steps, and falls to the ground, actually. That's, like, the end of it. Yeah. Um, that was... And so you got one guy isolated who's the person that's shot in yeah. this case. Uh, in the Kenosha shooting, you have one guy isolated who's taking the shots. Yeah. Um, now, the these were reported in more or less the same way by the media, uh, which I found <laughs> really interesting... Um, and, and actually one media report that I got was, uh, you know, um, uh, Kenosha, uh, man opens fire on protesters. Yeah. I saw some reports that looked like that. And then, so then I'm watching video of what happened here. And actually I thought the guy was pretty restrained. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. No, I talking about the one in Kenosha. Yeah. I agree. Um, I mean, I haven't watched. I've watched a lot of videos. I'm sure mm -hmm. there's some that I've missed of, of this altercation. Yeah, but, so many cell phones out there. Like, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I agree. Like, I felt like if he had been out there to just kill people, he didn't do a very good job. Yeah. Like, um, I he, mean, if, if that's, and that's the position of a lot of people is that, well, he's out there just shooting people. Mm -hmm. And if, if that's the case, he, he didn't do, he, yeah. could, he could have done a lot worse. He shot three people, all of whom were on video attacking, attacking him. him. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and Which is the reason you carry a gun, by the way, yeah. is for self-defense. And I do want to point out that the last guy, the guy that got his arm practically shot off, yeah. uh, was carrying a pistol. Had a pistol. Absolutely yes. was armed. Yeah. Um, approached him with the pistol. The kid brings up the gun. The guy is like, holds up his hand and backs off a little bit, and the kid yeah. lowers the gun. Yeah. And then he comes back at him uh, again, and then... We're not doing this yeah, again, then yeah. He, then like, he shot You him. had your opportunity to leave, yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, if he was out there just trying to kill a bunch of people, he'd have shot him the first time. Exactly. Uh, so I, I actually thought and he shot a lot of... a cop may have shot him the first time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, a cop almost certainly would have shot him the first exactly. time. Exactly. Um, actually, we should talk about that, too. I said I didn't want to talk about any of the cop shootings, but I, I would kind of like to bring up the Ryan Whitaker or whatever that guy... The one that That's I sent you the video. That's the one you sent me, yeah. Yeah. Um, in Phoenix that happened in Phoenix. Um, but, uh, so in, you know, one case you got the mob attacking, um, a guy that's on his own and killing him. And in another case, you got a mob attacking a guy on his own and he defends himself. That's what it looks like to me. Absolutely. But they were both presented as, you know, just like these crazy people out there trying to kill people. Yeah. Um, and if anything, actually the guy in Portland was treated more favorably by the the, well, you know, this Trump guy, he was out there, you know, stirring up trouble. He shouldn't have been there in the first place, et cetera, well, et cetera. Something we've all got to remember <laughs> through this whole thing is there's still a group of people out there that want to take guns for people. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, and the, the the media, that's basically who the media are, is a bunch of people who are anti-Second Amendment. Yeah. Um, so all of the stuff is going to be portrayed, at least through the stuff through the media, is going to be portrayed with that in mind, that we've got to get these guns off the street because look at what's happening here now. Um, so... Um, there was question with the kid in Kenosha of... Uh, you know what he was doing there. Apparently, he works there. He came. He lives like thirty minutes away in Illinois, and so yeah. they're like he crossed state lines, et cetera. But he apparently he works in Kenosha. Yeah. Um, and that he was doing this after work one well, day. But the the other thing is that well, you know, um, what? Why should he uh protect somebody else's property? Yeah. Right. Like, you know, what right does he have or responsibility does he have to protect someone else's property? And so I, I again, you know, I like to go back to to founding principles and I say, do you have a right or a duty to protect someone else's life? Yeah. And and you start there. Well, and, and I, I think at the least you have a right to. Mm-hmm. I mean, and I mean, some people may believe you have an obligation. Yeah. But at the least you have a right. Mm hmm. I mean, I think that you have a responsibility to protect somebody else's and I would, life. I would agree with you on that. Yeah. But, I mean, I would agree that you do have a responsibility. But, but at least that you have the right but to... But at the least you have the right. Mm-hmm. Um, so does that extend to uh, somebody else's property? I would, I would say it does. I think so, too. I mean, I, I do. I mean, these are questions you should ask yourself. I, I don't know that I can make, like, on the spot here, a strong argument as to why... Yeah. You should have the right to protect somebody else's property. But, um, you know, these, these all, uh, these all extend from one thing. Like, you know, if you have a right to your own life and your own property and somebody else has the right to protect your life, yeah. shouldn't they also have the right to protect your property? Yeah. I, I mean, I would agree with that. Um, it's something I just want people to think about. So everybody with all of these shootings and all the stuff going on, you want to try to look at each one and kind of grade it on the merits. And that's fine. But at the same time, there's so much chaos out there right now. It's, we really need to kind of be thinking about where this is all leading us. Mm -hmm. And I, and I don't know that there's anything in any of us can really do about it. I mean, the, the die has kind of already been cast. Vote libertarian. You could do that if, if you if you could convince enough people to do it, it may fix some of these problems. Yeah. But it's 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 things are crazy out there right now, and I just I don't I see a lot of avenues where this can get a lot worse really quick. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, and and out of control. Go yeah. buy guns. Well, yeah, we'll skip the <laughs> learn how to use them properly too. Yeah, that's important. Um, we'll skip the Whitaker thing for now. We we're already so long, and um, I did want to give a moment to just like do a quick review of the RNC. Yeah. So, so go ahead. I, I um, haven't, I haven't, haven't really seen watched any of it. So that. I thought Trump's speech was good. Um, I'm going to go back and read, we're going to talk about this in depth next week. Yeah. And there's, there's some speeches I missed and there's some that I want to go back and re-listen to. Mm-hmm. But um, just to kind of hit the high points, I mean, I thought um, Trump's speech was good. It was long. So I listened to the whole thing and I, live mm-hmm. and, I was kind of nodding towards the end, mm-hmm. but the first few minutes, like I, I was, I enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, he, he definitely has an ability to get you fired up, I think. Yeah. Um, and, and he threw, he threw a few little Trumpian jokes out there that yeah. just, I mean, he had me laughing. A this was a, bit. this was a canned speech though, right? This wasn't him up um, there doing no, a rally type. No, speech it wasn't a rally like type talking. speech, okay. but but even if you compare his versus Biden's, the energy level was just, of course, he did his in front of a law, live audience, too. Mm-hmm. And that is definitely a factor. Because he ain't scared. Because he ain't scared. And that was <laughs> that was the reason he made his speech as long as he did, was to show Biden and the Democrats, look, I can do this all day long. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and he can. So, yeah. Um, and it, like I say, it was just, it was a higher production value. It was a, it was a more entertaining to watch, mm-hmm. um, overall. And I felt like they hit a good message. I mean, they talked about the riots a lot. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, well, this is a, this is a valuable point to them right now. Yeah. Um, and it's, and it's something that they're <clears throat> right on. 
Um, whether you believe the state should be taking these de- riots down or you believe individuals should be doing it, somebody has got to step in and do something. Um, this this can't go on like this because we will be in the civil war if we if something doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, and that's that's a dangerous a dangerous thing. <laughs> I did hear um, Dave Smith uh, was talking about um, the they you know some headline or something where they said. Uh, um, shots uh, rang out amidst peaceful protests <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> something like that yeah. and he is like you know at at what degree of chaos can we stop calling this a protest yeah you know like it like we're going to go back in history and say uh, in 1863 shots rang out amidst a civil protest <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> well that's a fair point like. yeah I um any other speeches stand out to you um like I say, nothing offhand. There's definitely the um. So the Ivanka spoke before Trump, and I thought that one was all right. Um, you know, it was it was it was good. It watching her mannerisms are just was just funny to me because she mm-hmm. has a lot of the same ones that Trump has. Yeah, and it's just weird to see that on that per, on that persona. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's kind of like when you change your skins in a video game. <laughs> <laughs> So that was kind of my take from that. Yeah. Um, and then the, the I forget the lady's name, but I want to go back and listen to it again. But the lady that spoke before both of them um, was the woman that, that Trump pardoned and then later had some legislation that was passed. Mm-hmm. I and can't think of her name. Either. I can't think of her name, but um, that that one kind of got me. Like that was that was a very good speech. And it, it's it said a lot for the message that the that Trump is trying to put out there is mm-hmm. that look this man is not a racist i mean you can you can call him a lot of things but he th- he's just not a racist yeah. I, and i don't believe he is i don't think so either um I, I you know just, all the stuff of dog whistle and so forth like yeah. the guy speaks his mind do you think that he, yeah do you think that trump could be quietly a racist i just i don't believe it I mean, I, I, I don't. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, like I say, and this is coming from somebody that's not a fan. Yeah. But he's he's not a racist. Like, mm-hmm. he's not that. And I thought that speech was, like I say, I want to mm-hmm. go back and listen to it again. But I I, I liked it. I, I saw that um, both CNN and Fox cut away from Rand Paul's anti-war speech. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me. Yeah. Um, well, you say, yeah, it was, I guess it was anti-war. But, and Rand Paul's speech was good. I enjoyed it. But... It's kind of hard to watch him endorse, yeah, Trump just because yeah. of you know who his father was. Yeah, uh, he's yeah he's not Ron Paul, but he's uh, playing. And, and I've said this from the beginning when they were both in Congress. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're just playing a different game. Yeah. Um. And I don't know that Rand's is any better. Than, and I don't know that Ron's is necessarily any better than Rand's. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, like yes, Ron Paul absolutely built a movement and and done amazing things. But when you talk about real tangible accomplishments, Mm -hmm. can you really say he's done any more than Rand Paul? No. I mean, I I can't think of anything. I, yeah. And um, that's like I say, and this is coming from somebody who Ron Paul is close to my heart. Like I love this man. Like I truly do. Mm -hmm. But so I I have, I do have a hard time giving Rand Paul a whole lot of, of crap about the way he, he does. Yeah. But well, I mean, I think that he thinks that he can influence Trump in the right direction. And if he can, that's fantastic. Yeah. Well, and he thinks that and even prior to Trump, he thinks that he can influence the Republicans to to change the party, which is what Mm -hmm. Ron Paul always wanted to do, too. Just he was more principled at the way he did. He wasn't willing to give any. Yeah. Um, And I respect that. But in, in a way. It's just it's just a different tact, a different way to go about it, mm-hmm. and you know, I, I, like I say, I don't hate him for it. Yeah. So. Well, um, at nearly an hour and a half, <laughs> yeah, uh, may as well wrap it up there. Um, so, uh, as we said, we plan to uh, go into the RNC in more detail next week, um, and uh, so. Take on whatever current events, whatever's yeah, going on in the civil war out there. Whatever happens between now and then, because um, there's going to be plenty, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, so uh, join us again in a week uh, for another profoundly decent podcast <laughs> uh, when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life's short, live free. Ciao. Later. Mm-hmm.